Hey everybody, this is Catherine Barnes. I'm here with the wonderful Being podcast where we talk about music, theater, and neurodiversity. And today I'm really, really excited because I have my OG fringe friend and I will say role model. This guy is really like my role model for how you do a fringe festival. His name is David Harada. He is a magician. He is a solo theater artist and he has a lot of production experience as well. And I'm really excited that he's here hanging out with me today. So welcome, David. Hey, as as I told you, any excuse to hang out with you is is great. I'm I am so happy to be here. Um, any any time we hang out is just good times. And um, I agree. Uh, I um, you know, and and I'll say it it's it's interesting you say that about me. Uh, you know, after our meeting at at San Diego Fringe, and I'll I'll say back that you know watching your career and the way you've managed it creatively and I get you know from a more um, managerial standpoint or um, entrepreneurial standpoint has been really helpful to me um, as well and I I think it's one of the it, it is the best reason to engage in the performer community in the performance community the theater community whatever community you're in um, because there are just so many people who who um, I, I think we learn from, who, who, from whom we gain inspiration. And, and your, uh, your, your posts and podcast episodes on, on the recent San Diego Fringe and some of the artists there has been really wonderful for me to check in on. I, I, don't, I don't watch as many of your episodes as I would like, um, but I really enjoy it when I do. And um, so thanks for having me. And um, Oh yeah, absolutely. So while you were talking, I, I think where I actually want to start is with your experience as a producer, because I was I was looking at your LinkedIn and I saw that at the Marsh in San Francisco, you were the director of artist relations. And I was like, oh, I don't even know what that means, but he is the perfect guy to be doing that. So, like, tell me about what you did in that role. Yeah, that's interesting. So the Marsh, for people who don't know, the Marsh is it's a solo performance theater producing space in San Francisco with a satellite location in Berkeley. And I've been involved with the March in just about every capacity you can imagine since about 1993, I think is when I first walked in. Um, and I need to update that LinkedIn because I'm no longer working for the March. I've moved on. Um, so thanks for reminding me, but director of artist relations. Now, with a small organization like the Marsh, the truth is I was doing a crap ton of stuff. <laughs> um, but artist relations had to, I, I, I fell into that position because of my connections with the performance community. I just had worked with a lot of the local performers. And um, so on a nuts and bolts level, one of the things I did really was just traffic cop um, contracts, making sure that that contracts were edited and sent out and and signed and then filed that was that that was kind of a nuts and bolts thing that i did but i also curated what was called the march rising series so backing up a little bit or looking at it from the artist's point of view the challenge of developing a solo theater show from the beginnings to hopefully getting it to a full length to actually getting it produced in front of an audience is huge. And, and the marsh exists to make that possible, maybe a little easier. There is a works in progress series, which is where the marsh started. The Monday night, night marsh series is where it began. And it was a, a, you do 15 minute excerpts and it was in the back of a little bar in North Beach for years and, and eventually the march grew into the full organization it is now but the monday night series has continued and i uh, i stage managed that uh for for about five years um and and the idea with that was really it was minimally curated give people a place to put work in front of an audience um, but with the 15 minute excerpt of course you can only go so far and so the challenge then of then, well, well, for, for some number of years, the March really kind of existed at this place where, yes, there was the works in progress series and there was the weekend run 
there were late night runs and there were occasional midweek shows, but that that sort of middle development period where you've turned your excerpt into something longer and you need to you need to field test that. Um, that's that's one of the hardest places to be. Um, Fringe Festival, the Fringe Festival circuit is a great place to do that, but I, I think given the stakes for a Fringe Festival for the the solo theater artist, you really kind of want to arrive at a Fringe Festival with your with your work as sort of performance ready as you know premiere ready as you can get it. So that challenge of developing it is hard. So with that in mind, the March developed. Um, the March Rising series, which was kind of this opportunity for people to do these full length things. And essentially, it, it was largely a tryout for a possible full run. Hmm. Um, uh, because these were these were also one night performances, but they 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 gave the performers an opportunity to get the full length work in front of the artistic director and the production staff. Um, and if the artistic director felt the work had merit, then there would be further discussions about, well, she might feel, well, I think this needs that, this and that and, and development. And so some works might, some works might jump almost directly from that, that March Rising performance to a run. Others might spend several more months in development. There would be a lot of discussions on um, the the producing partnership with the art artist and the producing organization, the March, that is, um, you, you know, what is your, what, what, essentially what, what plans do you have for marketing the show? What tools do you have in place? Do you have, you know, photos ready? Do you have, um, an active social media presence, questions like that. So that, that sort of mid, mid early career development thing was a really important part of what I did there. And it's something I've tried, I, I've just tried to be a part of on some level, kind of in ever since I started doing this work. Um, and, and, you know, so for me meeting you at San Diego Fringe, it, it was, it, it was really as simple as like, here's, here's this really creative person um, with this really cool show with this energy and on some level, <laughs> um, as much as I just liked you and I liked your work, there was a certain self-interest to that. It's like, you know what, by getting to know people like this and create relationships with them, it helps me, um, mm. um, you, you know, from, from a career and artistic development standpoint. Um, and the fact that I just enjoy your company so much is, is uh, serious cherry on top. And, and that happens a lot too. I think you've found that you get to know really cool people and you, you gain so much from that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I love what you're saying because I think often in the arts, you know, there's, a, there's a sense of competition, like, because there's yeah. only so many resources and there's only so many shows that are going to get reviews and so many shows that are going to get awards, yeah. you know, and, and what you just said, I mean, that's, that's really what I, that's why I talk about you as my fringe role model, because that's like the attitude that I want to have when I'm in a fringe is like, look at all of these really cool people. How can I learn from them? You know? So, yeah. so I really appreciate that. While you were talking, you mentioned that you'd been involved with the Marsh since 1993. And I know that you did your first solo show in 1998. So can you talk about like sort of, how you developed that and how that came to be in those five years? Yeah, um, you know, so it all started really with the fact that I've been performing magic at a very young age. And I, I performed professionally um, in high school, a little bit in college. Um, and then uh, when I moved out to San Francisco and, and also, and then I was a theater nerd in high school. And, and also in college. So it was kind of this thing that here's magic, which is this form, which, um, you know, as done, it's, it's, it's kind of this light entertainment, hopefully done well. Um, but I, but essentially I got very interested in the question of, can it, can it be done artistically? Can it be used as a, as, as a means of artistic expression? So when I moved to San Francisco in the early 90s, the solo 
theater scene was really kind of blowing up and especially in San Francisco. At the time I moved there, there were, um, I would say there were at least four or five um, smaller mid-sized theater companies, including the Marsh, that were that were focused heavily on on solo performance, um, and so it it seemed like a time to explore that. So I took some workshops, and the the solo performance form, as you know, is is it's it's probably what ninety percent autobiographical. Um, and certainly that's a good place to start for someone who's never written a show. There's the write what you know principle. Um, and so I started from that. And at the time, sort of the question of um, Japanese American identity and history was very much on my mind. And so that first show was kind of an exploration of that with I felt that magic had some there's a possibility of that that magic visually can serve as metaphor um uh, metaphor and counterpoint or even just as just to add a little dazzle a little a little um exclamation point to things or or just just even a good laugh or or a sort of wow moment so it was kind of an attempt to figure out magic as a narrative tool, as a visual symbolic tool, and also just how to write a one person show. Um, and that first show, I, I look back and I, cring, and I cringe <laughs> thinking about a lot of it, just at stuff I didn't know. It was my first shot. Um, and it was, a, it was a pretty good first shot. Um, but I, want, I definitely wanted to move beyond that. Um, and so, but I kind of moved into just sort of performing straight magic for several years after that. And then there was kind of the matter of getting married and settling into a house and raising a child. And so there was that big interruption. And so then you have to fast forward to um, about you know, 2015 or 2016, when I think maybe I should go back into solo performance and maybe, and I had also, just become much, much better as a magician. I had been performing sort of straight magic. The, the body of technique I had to draw on was much greater. Um, and so so then that's where this show, the, the, the show where we met, which I had started out calling it the Jap Box, the, the, the starting point was this ma magician's prop, this very popular magician's prop from the Victorian era. It was still in fairly common use when I was a teenager called a Jap box. Um, and, and it stemmed in part from the history of that. I was, I was really, really surprised to discover that it was a prop of authentic Japanese origin. That just shocked the crap out of me. And then discovering the story of one of these early Japanese magicians who came to America in the 1860s and sort of this kind of, um, you know, a, a sort of kindred relationship we had as fellow performers and as as people of Japanese ancestry, and then weaving together this story, it, it was it, it was an opportunity for me to to improve on all the flaws I felt were there in Kanji by Starlight. Um, mm. I didn't improve all of them, but it was a much better show. I was much happier with it. Um, mm. So um, that's that's kind of that sort of then took me to San Diego Fringe, where I met you. Mm -hmm. And and that was, you know, that challenge to develop the show, you, you know, it, it, I worked with a director. And it's like, well, well, how do you develop this? I mean, I was able to do those works in progress things. Um, but you know, the version you saw in San Diego was still very, very rough. I mean, it was 35 minutes long, I think. Um, just barely. I remember 45, but maybe you're right. Maybe it was, was it was it was under 45. I mean, it was a much over half an hour. And and I kind of went when I when I realized that's how much material I had, I kind of went, well, holy crap, okay, this is a pretty short show, but it, it, it's fine. And, and fringe is about giving you that latitude to to bring that stuff out. And and so it was kind of like, well, okay, here's what I got. 
what works, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that was really important to then taking it to the next level, mm -hmm. to the, the uh, uh, version that eventually aired in kind of prime time, as it were, um, the 65 minute version. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, it, it all goes, so much of this goes back to that, you know, this, what I feel is a theme here in, in your podcast a little bit of the challenges of creating work and how do you, um, how you get past that. And for me, fringe was a really important part of that. Hmm. Okay. There's something I wanted to ask you about that you mentioned, um, because I remember one of the, the first scenes in your show is you taking your daughter out for sushi for the first time and she tries it and she likes it and I won't ruin it for people in case they have the opportunity to see your show but then she asks you a question kind of about her own identity that like sent you down kind of this rabbit hole of of processing your own identity and so what I wondered was do you think that becoming a parent had an impact on your work and on the solo show? Like, do you think that made it better? How do you think it impacted it? I, I, I the short answer to your question is yes, it, it definitely did impact it. Although there's a little footnote to that particular story. Um, if it's okay, I actually did set up that, that excerpt that you're talking about. It's the opening part of the oh, show. Oh, we can it's watch this, it? It's this discrete, yeah, and I actually yeah. have it. Because I think it's it's also useful. It sort of illustrates the way that I've attempted to integrate magic as narrative. And so I, I think it might be useful for people to, to see. So let me just hit the share screen here and pop this up. So here we go. From the trenches of parenthood, chapter six, the food of my people. My daughter was three years old, and after a very nice morning at the park, we went out for lunch to a noodle shop where she tried sushi for the first time, and she liked it. <laughs> but as we were sitting there sharing a platter of tekamaki, she looked up at me and she said, so am I Japanese? <laughs> well, you're half Japanese. So I'm half Japanese and half regular. <laughs> And I just kind of let it go. And I have no idea when this idea of regular was replaced in her head with white. Being that we live in the Bay Area, it was very likely the following week. But all this came to mind just recently when I went to the hardware store to buy some rope. Regular rope. White rope. The kind of rope that you would buy for a regular job. And it got me thinking about what it must be like to be rope of color. You know, the kind of rope that's just as strong, just as flexible, but isn't regular. Now, when I was growing up, dinner rolls were regular. Sushi rolls were us. Uh, the Beach Boys were regular. The story of Momotaro the Peach Boy was us. Now, I had seen every episode of the Brady Bunch, knew all the words to the Pledge of Allegiance, all those things that were regular, <laughs> that were a part of me. But it still didn't make me regular. Part Japanese, part regular <laughs> so that yeah that's the opening of the show that's um so that story um is i think in best um solo performance theater style or, or whatever it it is it's a concoction of of the historically accurate and some amount of um embellishment mm -hmm. um so the i it, it stemmed from my daughter being told that she was half japanese at, at about that age and and what she actually and i don't remember exactly the context of that but her her 
question really was, well, which half? Mm. Um, and and it reminded me actually of of a an interview with the Chinese American poet Li Young Li, whose children are are half Chinese, and and he's he actually recounted it's like oh, you know one of his children saying like am I Chinese? It's like well you're half Chinese and oh then I'm half Chinese half regular. So the half regular thing I I lifted from Li Young Li's story, but the sentiment was it, it it was sparked by a nearly identical or very, at least very similar conversation. So that idea of legacy, I think is kind of part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that idea of, of be, because that first show Kanji by Starlight, which was all about my own sort of questioning my ethnicity, it was, it was, it, it, this was about me. And of course it was before I was married, before I was a parent. So, you know, there, there is, I think, some cause and effect of being a parent and looking ahead to the, the future generations. And, and it's been interesting. It was, it was really interesting one time when, when my daughter was in high school and she talked about the kids she, she hung out with at lunch were, you know, the group was more than half Asian, Asian American kids. Um, and she once casually remarked, it's like, yeah, we're all, uh, we're all chopstick Asian, um, which I had never heard, you know, meaning of, of Japanese, Chinese, Korean extraction, as opposed to Central Asian, um, Indian, Pakistani, mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. So I, I thought, oh, it's like, oh, your generation has kind of come up with a term for that distinction. Interesting. Mm. Um, and, and so the way the way you know the younger generations have have run with this is is fascinating to me, and and I think it if it it, it also relates to kind of this controversy that uh, hit the show early on when you saw the show in San Diego, and and uh, I also did a short run in San Francisco, uh, two short runs, mm -hmm. the, the where the show was called the Jap Box in reference to the prop. Well, once it hit prime time, um, there, you know, there there was protest over that. And what was uh, prime time? Uh, when when it got the full run at the marsh, it got it got we, okay. it set up for an eight eight week run mm -hmm. at the marsh, um, and it was just much higher profile. You know, mm -hmm. we, we were getting press and all that kind of thing. Whereas there had been no comment about the title during the three previous runs. Um, I had I had discussed the matter with my family and with some Japanese American friends, um, and there, you know, and and when it ran in San Diego, a lot of the, my most supportive audience was from the Japanese American community in, in San Diego, mm -hmm. um, or members of this of the San Diego Japanese American community, because no community is completely homogenous, mm -hmm. and so the 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 protest emerged. And and it was actually really cool how measured the discussion was. Mm. I don't believe. Yeah, I never received anything that could even remotely be called hate mail. OK, mm. you know, if you're going to push people's buttons on this, on, on questions of race or ac accusations of racism or use of a racist term, um, I think one could reasonably expect some hate mail. I mean, it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. But I think the probability is very high, and, and that never once happened. Uh, what I did have were, were people reaching out, and and I had some really great measured discussions. Um, and after after a, a certain amount of discussion and consideration, and sort of hearing, I I made the decision to change the title of the show. It had to do with I think first of all again sort of being blindsided, it's like, well, look, every Japanese American who I've spoken to who's come to see the show up to this time has been fine with the title. Well, not all of them are, you know? Mm -hmm. And and for a lot of those who who were, um, I, I think the, I, I think in more than a few cases, I think the word traumatized is not an unreasonable word to use. Mm -hmm. and, and for a lot of them, they, it, they could be considered, you know, elders of my tribe. And therefore, mm. I think, do for some consideration that that's part of it um and and so 
and and then also that earlier drafts of the show really did deal more directly with the actual Jap word and its context and meaning in those early days of the 1860s, mm -hmm. uh, where it was a really a, a much more neutral term. It was a convenient shortening of the word Japanese that was used um, quite frequently in the press. Um, I quote a Mark Twain essay where, where he speaks very, um, uh, in, in very complimentary manner about these, these Japanese performers who've come over to the United States, but, but he is referring to them as Japs the whole way. Mm -hmm. But it, it really has to do with this shift that later occurs more in the 1880s um, when, when really it becomes a racist epithet. And I, I found that interesting, this, this shift, um, uh, which was present in some of the earlier drafts, but it pretty much gotten left at the, you know, left at the wayside by the time the show, uh, hit prime time. Um, and that emphasis wasn't there. It had kind of gone in a different direction. So, so that change to the title, a box without a bottom. Uh, felt like the move that, and th that title derives actually from the Japanese name for this prop that American magicians had known as the Jap box. It's known as the Soko Nashi Bako in Japan, which literally translates to box without a bottom. Um, and I actually really, it, that title came out of discussion with a, um, a, a March staff member, and I really liked that image, that mm -hmm. phrase. A, a, the idea of a box without a bottom is just, you know, kind of it, it evokes like a puzzle. The idea of this box without a, 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 you know, bottomless box and being able to to delve deep. I just really like that, and I, I, I think it's quite possible that had that been presented to me, I might have chosen that as the title originally, or at least mm. early, probably around second draft version, maybe maybe when it had, by the time it had run in San Francisco after San Diego. Um, so, you know, so that controversy was kind of, that was an interesting encounter with, um, uh, you know, the older generation, in part, in large part, the older generation of Japanese Americans, not entirely. I mean, to, to be fair, there were, there were people who had an issue with that who were, who were younger. Um, but that's where a lot of that uh, feeling came in. So there was this conversation with, with the older generation, the next generation, my generation, um, which feels kind of right. Mm. And see, that's interesting to me too, because I'm trying to think how to put this. I think that what, what I've noticed in a lot of social justice conversations is that it tends to be the younger generations who object to things. And so I was guessing that you were gonna tell me that it was younger folks who saw the show and were like, oh, you absolutely cannot use that word. But it was the older generations who came to you and said that. Um, and so I guess that just, that, that struck me as, as kind of interesting. Well, the, yeah, the, the, most of the ones with whom I had the more extended conversations were from an older generation, but there were younger people as well. But as, as I said, um, you know, I'm trying to parse out all those Japanese, Japanese American audiences who, uh, liked the show and accepted the original title. It's, it, I don't think you can say there was a single demographic there either. I think a lot of it had more to do kind of with, I think part of it was it's like, well, people who, um, you know, theater going people, um, and who, who are, I think where, where the idea of sort of pushing these boundaries, pushing boundaries mm. is kind of more, of, of a thing. I mean, I think that was part of it. Um, so it, it is, it, again, to me, it's just this idea that, that no community is completely homogenous. Mm -hmm. And I think really what we have to do is, is listen to each other as best we can, um, express ourselves as the best we can. Cause, cause one thing that also gave me pause that, that, frankly, might have been cause for me to change the title, even if 
that that issue of the history of the word itself had been more tightly woven into the final show was a conversation I had with my director about the way anything like this in today's day and age has has a certain life outside of the work itself. That's always mm -hmm. been true, but in the age of the internet, even more so. So the, 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 the plain honest truth was the number of people who were going to encounter the title of the show and only the title of the show, maybe the poster from the show, but never see the show itself mm -hmm. is much greater than the number of people who are actually going to see the show. And, and I think for better or for worse, that social media presence that that internet presence is part of the dialogue i mean we want our work to you, you, you know you want to say it's like well come see the show mm -hmm. you know read the damn book listen to the album go see the movie mm -hmm. um you know that's there are so much of the dialogue takes place in this other forum and then you know how much the artist decides that has to be part of of their process of their um, uh, of 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 their process and production. That that's like that's a whole other thing we could talk about for hours. Um, you know, so much so much nowadays, so much art is made strictly for that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for that platform now. You know, um, wow. No, I mean what you just said. I think that that's. I'm going to have to bookmark that and come back to that because that is, that is so true. And I think this is the first time I've heard it articulated that way. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And I, I still don't have answers. It's, 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 I, I still think about that and, you, you know, I've, I've got just the beginnings of a new show I want to develop. <gasps> um, I, I'm still tinkering with, I mean, it's, it is such early stages, mm -hmm. but at least as I go through my notebooks and the material I've, I've built into performance, you know, I think it's about the nature of faith. Mm. And, and, and when I say that, that cannot be therefore absent, that cannot be separated entirely from the question then of religion. Mm -hmm. um and so exactly where this goes i'm still not sure uh, but if it does go into questions of faith and religion well someone's probably going to be offended um if the show gets any um if it gets seen at all if it gets any any visibility at all and so then what do we make of that how does how does that get handled and mm -hmm all that is, but, but it's, it's still such early days in the development of the thing that I, I really don't know. Well, and it's interesting too, because, you know, the, the controversy around the name of your show didn't come up, as you said, until it got a certain level of visibility. And I would think right. that in the development stages, and I mean, I've, I've had this same problem with my own shows, you know, but in the development stages, you know, I sit there trying to predict like, well, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to what's going to bother somebody? And it's it's I mean, it's kind of impossible to know yeah. other than making sure that I'm performing for a lot of different kinds of people and, and you know, having a director and, and getting good feedback. That's really the only way. But you can't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for, for me, you know, I tried as much as possible and continue to try as much as possible to to approach it as much as I can from the question of what is the intended message of you know themes what 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 is this saying what am I trying to say and then alongside that then has to be kind of the question of like and how successful am I saying it mm. uh, how, how successful am I at saying that at communicating that um, so and then I think then a certain question of, well, what are what are the possible rebuttals? And then what is what is the importance of of, of the, the public forum, you know, outside of the show, the performance of the show, or, or say if it's a book outside of, you know, the actual pages of the book, what is the importance of that public discussion? 
um, you know, I, I was reading your dispatches from San Diego Fringe. I was really kind of fascinated with that uh, love in the time of Taksim. Taksim, yeah. Um, as uh, you know, Turkish and Ottoman history is a, a hobby of mine. Um, and so I kind of went, oh, okay. Um, and I thought, wow, I, I, I'll, I'll have to read her book because I understand she's got a book version mm -hmm. of it. And, and also that its focus is, is that it's got, it's got several lines of focus within that story. But, you know, the, the Turkish people are at such an interesting and dynamic and in some ways delicate place in their history, I think you know, not so different from ours. I was about it, to say it, exactly that. Yep, yep, yeah. there's a lot of parallels. Yeah, and this question of how you balance these these conservative traditions and the people who, who treasure those and this sense of going forward. And, and for the Turkish people, this idea of East versus West, I mean, this is even before you get it, the question of conservative Muslim values versus you know, 21st century secular values. There's just even the question of of being, um, you know, a, a, a an, an Eastern nation, Middle Eastern nation. I mean, whether you consider it part of the Middle East, but this this country with deep roots in uh, the Middle East, in you know, the the, the Ottoman Empire and and everything it it stood for and it created, um, and then this this domination by the west in the in 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 the modern 21st century industrial world and how 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 do you balance that how do you create an identity out of that and um i, I find it fascinating to watch them as they as they struggle with that and i and i i don't get to see it closely enough to really know um but but you know, I wonder how if if you create a show that that focuses on you know these very public um, protests in Taksim and was that two thousand eight or thereabouts? I can't quite Sounds remember right. exactly when that was. And and then you know that so these very touchy, delicate matters. I I wonder how um, uh, a Turkish citizen might react to the show i didn't i didn't see it or you know how certain content of the show or portrayal of of those protests um and and so if if you have that you know what am i trying to say what are the naysayers going to say what kind of discussion will that form and i guess how can we make that productive hopefully mm -hmm. may, may be the question to ask i, I, I don't know no, those are all those are all really, really big questions and, you know, questions that I think as solo artists or as, you know, artists of any stripe, we definitely need to be asking ourselves. I got kind of curious while you were talking about about the fact that when you did the show at the Marsh, it was this eight week run. Right. And you referred to that earlier as prime time and, um, you know, that it got all of this exposure. And I guess I was kind of curious about as an artist, as a solo artist, what was it like producing a run that was that long and that visible? And what kinds of things did you need to do to bring in audiences? And how was that different from just like doing a fringe or a shorter run? Yeah, so if there's a lesson for fellow solo theater artists, um, or, or theater artists, you know, independently producing theater artists. Um, it is it is the importance of I think there are several. One is understanding the the entrepreneurial nature of of any theatrical production, and you know, social media gives us an opportunity to 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 leverage our our visibility. Um, as you know very well, and one thing I've just been admiring you so much for these last couple of years, it's a lot of work. You've been putting a lot of work into this, and you kind of have to lay that groundwork. Um, and, you know, this business of building a social media 
following um, presence, let's call it a presence, that in itself is work. Um, and some of it for me, frankly, is kind of distasteful. Oh, yeah. Um, all, a lot of it is distasteful. I don't think you're yeah. alone in that at all. Yeah. But but there are there are things like, you know, maintaining a a mailing list, you know, and, and if you're doing that, well, then you got to you got to create and send out the damn newsletter, you know, um, you know, having a YouTube channel. Um, but I think also when you have a show trying to figure out um, a sort of core audience, the people who are going to get you, who are going to in, benefit from the show or enjoy it because you know a big take-home lesson for me from from my show from that run it was eight weeks and it was extended to 12. Um, oh my god i didn't know that whoa yeah we, we, we got we got a four-week extension um that's incredible well and 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 what's encouraging about it is that you know one one reason I really wanted to produce through the March? The March is this established producing organization in the Bay Area, and to to put it simply, the press returns the March's phone calls. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for an artist, there's nothing more frustrating than managing to do one of to to set up a run for yourself, quite likely through four walling through through self producing renting the space and you can do all the right stuff of getting out the press releases and hitting up your mailing list and the social media thing and then the press never comes yep <laughs> um very very common and discouraging and an organization like the march i knew that producing at the march the press would come mm -hmm. um now for me that was that was a plus minus the, the reviews were were mixed you know to put it bluntly they were mixed and in fact so as as a member as as a staff member at the march who's worked there since the mid 90s up into mm -hmm. the early 2000s and i took some time off and all that but i distinct i i really remember back in in the 90s when i was working for the march and i was i knew those audience numbers i was watching the press on shows very carefully and and I would often remark to friends, it's like, well, you know, at that time there were three, there were four major papers um, in San Francisco. There were the two free weekly papers, and then there was the San Francisco Chronicle, the paper of record, so to speak, and the San Francisco Examiner, the other commercial paper, but less with a smaller circulation. And and as I would say to people, well, if 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 a show gets a good review in the weekly, the SF Weekly, one of the free papers, you know, it'll boost audience a little bit, you know, it'll maybe give us an extra five people a week. If it gets a good review in The Guardian, we'll get maybe an extra 10 people a week. Examiner, you know, maybe 15 or 20. Chronicle is the one you want. It's paper of record, you get a good review there, you're set. Mm -hmm. You're just set. Mm -hmm. um, and so conversely, I saw shows get mediocre or bad reviews in the Chronicle. And then I would just kind of brace myself for like, OK, this show is going to struggle. Mm. You know? And that's what would happen. Well, mine got a, 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 an OK review in the Chronicle. It, it got the, you know, the, the little icon is the sitting man in the Chronicle. There's if, if the if the little man is clapping, that's good. If he's standing in his chair and clapping, that's your five star review. If he's sitting upright, that's an okay review. That's what I got. Then he might be dozing, in which case you're dead. And if the if the critic really hates the show, the chair is empty. Um, so, oh my god! <laughs> yeah. Oh, and and as you probably know, I mean, and people in theater hate these systems. You know, whether it's <laughs> the little man, whether it's the star system, whatever. We hate him. I mean, the, the <laughs> number of times I'd sit on, on on things like, oh, God, I hate the little man, you know, I mean, <laughs> yes, if we get the clapping man, we're happy. But the way that it sort of it, it, you know, as with, you know, stars and reviews, it just distills it down and oversimplifies things because 
because there were a lot of good shows that would get Sitting Man. The, the point of Sitting Man, if you actually read the little legend in the Chronicle, is it has merit. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not perfect, but it has merit. But Sitting Man, I knew from back in the 90s, it's like, no, kiss of death. Sitting Man was kiss of death. You had to have Clapping Man or Standing Clapping Man. Well, I got Sitting Man. And the show did well. It, the, the show, people came to see it more than once. People, the word of mouth was clearly good on my mm. show. And the fact that I got Sitting Man and even one or two pretty bad reviews, people who just didn't like it, um, didn't really hurt it. Now, would a good review in the Chronicle have helped? Oh, hell yeah. But my show, it, it had a particular kind of message it, it, that appealed to certain people and those people found it and liked it, mm. you know? And, and so with kind of the internet and social media, it is possible, I think, to, to connect then with a sort of core audience, enough people to come and, and make a show successful to fill up the audience on a, on a consistent basis that 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 is possible now i think it in a way it was maybe less possible back in the 90s when when the media um were kind of the gatekeepers where you know that review by that one critic just counted for so much more it is possible to to sort of move beyond that to to build audience um you know part of it is from you know things like yelp reviews or um, th there are uh, th like Gold Star, the the ticketing service. Um, mm. Did you have a Yelp you know. for your show? No, no. I mean, I, I kind of grabbed at that. I, I as best I know, there were no Yelp reviews. Um, but Gold Star was kind of useful. Mm. We we sold half price tickets through there, and and that gets it in front of a kind of another um, potential audience base. Mm -hmm. um, so so there are there are these marketing tools and realities of marketing i think in the 20 21st century that make it possible for a shoot show to do at least do well and let's um, i i want to stop you for just a second because i really want to highlight this whole thing that you've just said because you know first earlier we were talking about social media and marketing and how you need to do that as a solo artist and how it can be really really distasteful and yeah. frustrating and just all the things right and and it is and it's hard and i've struggled with it a lot and it sounds like you have too and now you've just told this amazing story where your show got the cynic man which as you said would have been the kiss of death at one time and yet it got extended for you know an additional four weeks which is i mean that's just such a such a triumphant story you found your audience independent of these gatekeepers like yeah that's super cool yeah it, it, it is and and so you know what i was trying to leverage were so, so with any show there's kind of this question of who might be the subpopulations who might have interest in your work mm -hmm. right so for me obviously it was the japanese american community the magic community those were two places for me to start and um and and both those communities came out in decent enough numbers and sort of helped spread the word to sort of the people who were none of the above enough mm -hmm. of none of the above so there, there's, there's kind of the way um, that can work. And you and I have talked about with your show, you know, there are, you know, with this issue of consent and the way that you treat it in this multifaceted way, there are, there are medical Im implications. <laughs> there, there, are, there are implications in education, mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would say in parenting um, mm -hmm. and just in sort of, you know, being a regular person or being an American abroad, you know, there are, are it, it is a multifaceted uh, 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 view that you give. And therefore, each facet gives a potential audience, um, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, maybe not a huge one, but it's a place to start and, and hopefully you manage uh, to leverage that. Um, 
so um yeah it it, it is still kind of a mystery <laughs> in so many ways of of um this question of marketing because because let's face it, it it does boil down to marketing it does so much and that's that's a challenge and at times a source of despair i don't mind yeah. saying no you're right you're definitely correct about that yeah. yeah yeah was your show streaming at all when you did it at the marsh or did you just perform it no. live no because um you know that was we closed down two months before lockdown happened oh my god um, okay and and so i did kind of short excerpted versions of it streaming but um mm -hmm. there was enough sort of breaking of the fourth wall and then um and and you know frankly all, although there was a lot to be happy with with the run of that show um you know i'm so much in a place of like of of sort of glass half empty of you know the tortured artist thing i guess of like oh my god how how could i have thought to get away with that like oh yeah god um i'm sort of ready i, I think that's part of the reason i'm really wanting to move on to something else mm -hmm. um in some ways there are things i learned from that show that i want to apply to the next thing mm -hmm. hopefully do better um but you know, again, for a show with all the flaws mine had, and it, it did have, it did have them, um, it still found an audience and, and a very enthusiastic one. In fact, it's, um, I'm doing the show at least one more time in November in the Bay Area. Um, Brian Copeland, a, a local a Bay Area performer and producer, produces a kind of, um, he calls it the best of San Francisco solo theater thing he had booked me for the end of 2021 lockdown came shut us down or that was 2020 whatever whatever whenever the hell lockdown was 2020 <laughs> yeah um but so so we're catching up so i'll be doing it as part of that series in in november and brian told me um i i've had people requesting this show <laughs> um uh and i thought okay all right, that's cool. Um, they'll get to see it warts and all. I'm I'm actually working on on it. I'm tweaking the ending. I'm hoping to. There's there's a little something that I'm thinking. I'm hoping we'll kind of boost it up a notch. And I, I'm working on some of the problematic middle parts to hopefully make the thing better. Um. But again, you, you know, I I think it is there is audience for so many times as a member of a producing organization, as a staff member of the March, have I seen fantastic shows that have done only mediocre or even poorly at the box office where I'm thinking, damn it, damn it, damn it. This show has so much to offer, but you know, if something misses on the marketing or, or, or if the press happens to not give it, you, you know, the, 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 the praise, I think it deserved all these things can kind of stand in the way. And, and on another level, I mean, the, back when I was working for the March back in the nineties. And when I, when I walked away from it, because, you know, we had a baby coming and I was going to be parenting the very last show that I house managed for the March. Um, what was his name? Elliot Fintushel. I think it was the performer's name. He was like a MacArthur fellow and this and that. I, I didn't know him, but his piece was an almost, the text was, derived from the book of revelations he sort of took the book of revelations and turned it into this performance art piece okay and and he he used like dance and and theatrical movement and masks and music and stuff but it's a tough text yeah. if you've never read the book of revelations it is a very <laughs> tough text there is not a lot of fun in the book of revelations and there are there are very few punch lines in there if there are any and i'm pretty sure there are none so it was a very challenging piece and box office wise the show did not do great but it was really encouraging to me as as a house manager to see people come back mm. um, and then routinely routinely every night that i house managed there would be two or three or four people, not many. Okay, let's let's not, not gloss it over. Not many. Two or three or four people 
who, who would stop and say how much they loved the show. And I was not one of those people who got the show. I would kind of look at it and I would appreciate it, but mm -hmm. I didn't get it. But it meant a lot to me as, as a theater producer, as a staff member of a producing organization. It's like, you know what? This really did matter to some people. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a small number, but it really mattered. And that, that felt okay to me. And I think for, for those of us as artists, we, we want to find those people for whom the work really matters, where it really uh, connects. And hopefully it's as many as possible. Um, you know, that, that's where we juggle sort of the, the dollars and cents aspect in the marketing thing. And, and how do we, how do we make back as much of our, our, you know, investment in this and how much does that matter? How much does it matter to us to, to reach the mainstream, whatever the hell that is. Right. Um, right. You know, the, these, these very nuts and bolts questions for any artist that, that mm -hmm. I felt lucky to be able to see it from both sides. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. And you, you certainly have. And um, I'm really glad that I learned more about what you did at the Marsh. I don't think I knew the full extent of it. You've now moved on. You're living in Seattle now. Um, yeah. You're working on a new show. What's next for you? Well, you know, this is me having to build everything from scratch. Because um, I think I did get a little complacent in the Bay Area. I had connections, you know, places to perform, whether it was, you know, doing my doing my magic show for a ticket paying audience, um, you know, for a producer who could fill the house. Um, or or theatrical work for the marsh, where again, you know, the press would return their calls, and and I, I could get some audience, at least some base audience, and to build from. Much easier if you've got a producer with a a a base audience. You know, if 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 you have a show and you bring it to um, to a theater which has a subscriber base and you're there as mm -hmm. part of their season, well, then you at least get the subscribers, you know, and, and it's mm -hmm. possible to build off that much harder as an independent uh, artist. If you're having to build from a half dozen people in the audience opening mm -hmm. weekend each night, you know, that's hard. That's brutally hard. <laughs> um, and, and so I had kind of connections to be able to do that. Um, and now, now I'm, I'm just the stranger here. So I have to, I have to sort of find the places to do that. Um, I've, I've decided as part of this, that I'm just going to go back to performing as a profession, which is where I need to change my LinkedIn. Cause now I'm a full-time professional magician again, after I don't know, 10 years, but to at least keep my hand in and to be, and, and I'm able to sneak in some of that material that may make it into that next theatrical show um into just kind of a regular show um so it, it is starting from scratch i'm i'm reminded of of uh, this this thing neil gaiman said to struggling artists that i repeat to myself a lot it's gaiman said um people uh people will want to work with you if one they like your work two they like you Three, you get the work in on time. Um, and you actually only need two of the three. Um, and he was speaking as a writer, of course, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. Mm. Uh, that, that your work being liked, you being liked, um, and getting the work in on time, um, as far as being able to work with producers and, uh, um, you know the people on on the, the producing end of things that's important that that has to do with how easy are you to work with um how do they like your work you know how 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 good of a partner are you that i i think that's the essence of what game is saying um and so uh it is it is getting to know the landscape here and getting myself to be known in this landscape here both of audiences and you know people more at the producing end it's it's an interesting place to be. It is kind of it's it's more working without a net than I've been in in decades. But it's kind of exciting. It is really exciting. Oh yeah, 
And and honestly, I'm excited. I think I'm going to have to have you back here on the show, um, you know, as you start working on your new solo theater piece and also as you start to get involved up in Seattle because they're lucky to have you. And I'm excited Aww. to hear about about all the things that you're going to do because it's going to be it's going to be awesome. And I have family and friends in Seattle, so I'm happy that you're going there because that gives me more excuses to, to be up there. So can't can't wait can't wait to see you here and um you, you know um yeah any excuse to talk to you i'm i'm down i'm there i am so there excellent so my final question for you is where can people find you online if they want to connect with you oh okay um i am in the process of redoing <laughs> my website um but the url is thingsimpossible.com all one word uh, thingsimpossible.com. I am on Facebook, um, facebook.com slash things impossible. Um, and I'm on Instagram. Um, my Instagram name is Hirata David at Hirata David on Instagram. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's where you would find me. And, um, I'm, you know, again, being sort of more in performer as profession mode. I'm working on videos and stuff like that. Uh, you know, online content is becoming more of a thing that, that I'm working on and redoing that website. That that website is uh, something I've been wanting to redo for years. So um, websites are like that. They're just always in a perpetual state of needing to be redone. At least that's my experience with them. Um, one final thing. So you said you're going to be doing the box without a bottom again in San Francisco in November. Do you have dates for that yet or not yet? I um, I want to say November eighteenth, um, and it's in it's in San Leandro, uh, in the East Bay of um, of uh, yeah. It's it's uh, November eighteenth, nineteenth, uh, and twentieth. Uh, in San Leandro, and it's the Best of SF Solo Festival. Um, so if you if you were to Google Best of SF Solo Festival, you would you would find the website. And there's a lot of other really great shows going on as part of that. Um, cool. I think I think the first ones aren't for another month or two. Um, I know my friend Laura Austin Wiley is doing her show, The Paris Effect. Um, I believe my friend Irma is doing her show. Why would I mispronounce my own name? I might be wrong about that, but I think she's I think she's part of that lineup as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you're in the Bay Area, totally check it out. And um, awesome, L lots of great shows to see. So I will make sure there are links to um, everything that you just mentioned. Fantastic. And um, hey, I I really appreciate you hanging out with me today. And um, let's do this again soon. Yeah, yeah, let totally let's do it. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.